So it looks like everybody um, that said that they would be able to make it are, 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 are on the line right now. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, it's, it's really great to, to have so many of you tune in with us. Um, my name is Jessica Hinshaw, and I'm the Monitoring and Evaluation Coordinator at Amos. Um, but I also was um, the Global Health Education Coordinator for the past two years. And I'm still working a lot with the, the Global Health Practicum. So um, it's, a, it's a really amazing program and we're so excited to have you guys. And thank you everybody for, for sharing your, your, your responses here. It's looking really great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. So this is the, the 20, 2018 Global Health um, Internships and, and Internships Logistics Information Session. So like I said, if you ever have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat box and we can go back to those um, when we're at the question and answer session at the very end of, of this call. Um, however, if you also just want to save your questions to the very end, we can unmute everybody and um, you can just ask your questions directly to me. So, um, and I'm seeing that there's a lag from when I, I when I changed the slide to when you guys are getting the slides. So I might be pausing a little bit between the slides. So um, there has you know large demand for short-term experiences in global health. We have experienced that firsthand at Amos. Um, we've seen you know probably a sixty percent or seven in the number. So, and all of these students are looking for really meaningful ways to plug into global health, to plug in sustainably with the communities, um, to, to work on, you know, social justice um, causes and health equity causes. Um, there are huge benefits to students who participate in short-term experiences in global health. Um, there's more, usually the, these students who come out of out of global health experiences have more awareness of social justice, social injustice. They're more likely to work with under-resourced populations after they, 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 they work in a short-term research experience with global health. However, there's very little known about um, the unintended consequences for host communities and host institutions that are, are on the receiving end of students who come to do short-term experiences in global health. And usually short-term experiences in global health um, are between a couple of days up to six or seven months. So that's usually the range for what people consider a short-term experience in global health. Um, also, um, in the literature, there's very little, um, that, that little, there's very little research coming out of developed countries um, and, and hosting agencies about the impact that, that those hosting agencies see um, on their communities um, as, as being partners in these short-term ex short experiences in global health. Um, and a lot of times developing countries and, and hosting institutions are not um, a part of, asked to be a part of any of these working groups that write guidelines for short-term experiences in global health. So um, one set of guidelines that we try to abide by at Amos um, is called the WAIT guidelines. And so this um, stands for the Working Group on Ethics Guidelines for Global Health Training. And it was developed by a multidisciplinary, multinational group of experts from the Americas, Asia, Europe, and Africa. So it's a, it's a, it's a, really, um, it's a really amazing set of guidelines that is really inclusive and really thinks about you know, students and sending agencies like your universities and also hosting institutions and communities. So the guidelines that WAIT has um, set out for hosting institutions, which is like us at Amos, um, one, they call for well-structured programs. Um, they also call for clearly defined expectations between hosts and trainees. Um, the problems that these trainees and students and people who are coming to institutions um, for, for these short-term global health experiences um, their projects should be based on local needs and priorities. Um, there should be the formation of long-term partnerships. Um, this is a really big one. Um, the hosting institutions really need to recognize the true costs 
So um, how much time does it take, you know, for example, example, our volunteer coordinator to work with you guys to set up the guest house to make sure that um, you have a place to stay and are, are eating healthy foods and um, how, how much time does it take one of our logistics coordinators to coordinate a trip out to the community for you guys and what kind of materials are we buying um, for the projects and for the course portion of the class. So we have to really take into account those, those true costs and make sure that it's um, uh, what we call a fair trade learning um, exchange. Um, hosting institutions should promote transparency. So something we like to do at Amos is we always like to say, you know, we're, we're continuously learning. Um, we're a learning organization, so we will tell you um, the things that we feel like we're, we're not doing as well or the things that we think we can improve on. Um, so, so that's one really beautiful thing about Amos, and, and, and we, we really take pride in the, the lifelong learning aspects of, of our team and our organization. Um, we like to encourage non-threatening communication. So one example, or a couple of examples of this, we use um, a, a methodology um, that's called restorative justice. Um, so basically, restorative justice circles. So basically, if you know, in our internship teams or in our global health practicum, we're having some kind of conflict, we like to use um, restorative justice circles to resolve that conflict. And it's, it's a really beautiful way where everyone gets to, to talk and share and start from the same, um, basically starting point. So everyone will recognize the same problem um, from the same position. And it's, it's just a really great way to work through conflicts. Um, we also uh, have everyone sign team contracts and really talk about their strengths and their weaknesses and um, also how they, how they deal with stress. So that's really important um, part of our, our communication and the structure of our program. Um, we ask you guys what your level of training and education is and then in the communities we ask you guys to be transparent and honest with the community members. Um, so for instance, in the past, I don't think this happens as much, but in the past, medical students um, oftentimes might start uh, helping out with medical procedures that they, they probably shouldn't have been helping out on. Um, so we just always ask you guys to be very transparent with your level of training and education to our community members and to our staff. Um, we also look for trainees who are really flexible, culturally sensitive, culturally humble, and motivated. Um, and then finally, we like to give effective mentorship and supervision. And I'll explain a little bit about the mentorship and supervision a little bit later. So the, the guidelines for trainees, which would be um, you guys, are one, recognize that experience, experiences in global health is about global health learning. And, I, and you know, just interviewing you guys, so you guys are coming just from, from a really beautiful starting point and, and, we, and we're so excited to get to know you. We think all of you guys are really coming from this starting place. Um, we ask for you to communicate clearly with, with us and with any mentors um, that will be with you during the global health practicum and the internships. Um, most of you guys have really great Spanish language skills. So thank you so much for doing that. But those of you who don't, if, please take the time to practice um, because this not only will affect your, your overall satisfaction with the program, but it will really affect how you can, can collaborate with community members and get to know them. So that's a really, really um, important piece of, of this. Um, so we ask that you guys work within our existing structure at Amos and you're not seeking to, to do new projects because those new types of projects are not sustainable um, to us. We, we, we always ask you guys to work within our sustainable programs so that we can follow up with it, um, that these, these issues and the programs that you're working on are real needs for the community. Um, and that's where we always start from. Um, we ask you guys to have a, a level of cultural competency and even better yet, cultural humility. And we have a whole module on that. So when you guys get here, we're gonna talk a lot about cultural humility, which just basically really encourages people to be lifelong learners, um, to not use stereotypes and to um, really challenge power and in injustices or imbalances in power. Um, we also ask you guys to, to, to be aware of the environment that you're coming into and take safety precautions. 
Um, so for instance, we have had interns that in, in global health practicum participants that have actually walked around our community our, where we're located in Managua at night. And so this, just in the context of Nicaragua, is not safe and it's not healthy for you. And it's probably not healthy for our community either because they probably might be questioning, you know, like what are, what are these interns at Amos doing out walking at night in the community? So, so just be, and we'll, and we'll go over those safety precautions precautions when you guys get here. But please just be um, really considerate and conscious of those safety precautions. Um, also, it goes uh, back to the mentorship piece, which is related um, to what I already had said about mentorship. So we, we, we try really, really hard during the Global Health Practicum to, to provide you with a group of experts, with a group of mentors, and with um, really amazing community leaders that are all working together to, to try to improve health for the most vulnerable populations. Um, we ask that all of our, and we'll get into a little bit of, of this later, but we ask for all of our, our students to follow our guidelines, our ethical guidelines on publication and authorship. So one thing about Nicaragua is it's really, really hard to publish. So we work very closely with the, um, the Ministry of Health here, and any publication that we try to put out has to go through the Ministry of Health. And that can oftentimes take years. So for instance, we had someone who was a research partner with us back in 2016, and her paper still hasn't made it through the, the, the Ministry of Health. So if that is something that is a, a really big, um, important thing for you, um, we just ask you to be really considerate of, of how we work with the Ministry of Health here, because that could actually put us in jeopardy if you publish um, without the Ministry of Health um, looking at the paper and approving it. Um, so that's something that we're always trying to do. And then uh, some other kind of things with publications, we always put the community members who work with us on the projects on our publications. So um, just kind of, this is just a little brief introduction of uh, a little taste of what we'll, what we'll be getting into in the Global Health Practicum. But I just wanted to take a minute, um, just so people, uh, and I'm sure you guys are, might already be aware of this, but just to kind of reflect on the history of global health. So global health is, is really related to global, globalization and colonialism. Um, so, you know, and I know you guys know the story, but you know, when first the colonists and explorers um, from Western countries were exploring the quote unquote new world, they brought diseases to these indigenous populations who, who were vulnerable to these epidemics because they, they didn't have the immunity to the diseases. Um, we also see this in the modern era with globalization, um, with, with AIDS and Ebola. So just as, as the world is coming together and becoming smaller, there, there is a, a spread of disease. But during colonization, um, it was largely brought from the West to the colonies and, and had huge impacts on those colonies. Like for instance, in Haiti, none of the indigenous population is, is surviving because they were wiped out by, um, by, by diseases that the colonists brought and explorers brought. Um, new and existing diseases destroyed um, the labor force that colonizers were hoping to exploit. So, if you think about some of the, the mining companies, especially in, in, in Africa, um, a lot of these mining companies had intentionally tried to, to stop the spread of disease within, within their workers. And it kind of seemed altruistic, but it really wasn't because the poor health of their workers was a detriment to these colonial powers. And it was, it was you know, taking away money from the colonial powers um, economies. So, so there was a huge benefit for the colonizers to improve health for their labor, um, which were the people that were colonized. So that's a really big, important um, part of global health. And it's, it's a really messy and, and complicated so research and development today is really has a West first attitude. Um, there, there have been huge advances made in vaccinations and preventions and treatments. Um, however, um, a lot of these, these, these treatments that are, that are, that we're, we're, we're making 
are intended to curb the spread of disease so that it does not reach the Western world. So if you can just think back a little bit to Ebola, that's, that's really what was happening. You know, we had a lot of doctors going in and, you know, a lot of it was really altruistic and wanting to, to help the countries, but a lot of it was, oh, we have to stop the spread of disease from getting to these other countries. And, and so it really wasn't that altruistic. So just a, a brief moment of reflection on kind of the, the roots of global health. Um, however, knowing about these roots, we really want to challenge you in a global health practicum. Um, so I was recently reading the Book of Joy. I don't know if you guys have, have heard about that book, but it's about the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And it's, it's a really fabulous book. I highly recommend reading it. So at the beginning of the book, the Dalai Lama was describing his people's plight in Nepal in connection with other groups around the world who, who were also suffering. So I'll backtrack a little bit because this is something, this is really a common reaction that we see from people to contrast their own uh, situation of poverty or their own lifestyle was with those of others, right? So, so a lot of people um, come to Nicaragua, they contrast their, their living situation in the United States with those of poor Nicaraguans. However, in this instance, the Dalai Lama did not simply stop at comparing other people's situations with his own. It, it was something more. And this is what we really, really encourage you to do. Um, and this is just a quote from, from the book. The Dalai Lama was not contrasting his situation with the others, but he was uniting his situation with others, enlarging his identity and seeing that he and the Tibetan people were not alone in their suffering. So when, when this recognition occurs, that we are all connected, this is the birthplace of empathy and compassion. Um, and so at Amos, during the Global Health Practicum, we're always gonna push you to use critical theory to unpack issues of social injustice and really encourage you to see how you're connected to others um, in the world. And so one quote that you're probably gonna hear during the Global Health Practicum quite a lot is from Lila Watson, and she's an Aboriginal activist in Australia, also a professor. The one quote that she always said, or that she has said is, if you have come to help, here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So we really, really encourage you to reflect on those words um, and, and think about the place that you're coming from um, as you're coming to the Global Health Practicum. Um, so a, a lot of you guys, I know during the interviews, we shared about the mission and vision of Amos. So Amos is a Christian nonprofit organization, um, and, and we're here to work alongside impoverished and vulnerable communities um, to improve health education and development. Um, and here's where I'm going to start talking a little bit about logistics. So we will be shortly sending you the global health practice syllabus. Um, and this will have a list of readings and quotes and also our, our course instructors um, on the syllabus. So we'll be sending that out to you within the first um, week of May. So be on the lookout for that. We also send you a Google Drive folder, um, your read, copies of your readings. And I know Sharon, our volunteer coordinator, just sent you guys um, an email. And, and in the email, it asks you to respond if, if you would like um, a binder full of the reading materials. We're really promoting this year, um, if, if you don't feel like you want the binder, please opt out for it, because we're really trying to save paper. We actually just started a recycling um, initiative at Amos. Um, there's, no, there's no free recycling here. We have to take it um, to a place. But we're really trying to start a recycling initiative and, and really use our resources wisely. Um, so, so if you don't want that binder, you don't feel like you would use the, the written materials and you would just prefer to have it all electronically, please um, let us know. Um, so this is our, what we call our organigramma for the Global Health Practicum. So overseeing and, and also um, founding the Global Health Practicum is our medical director, Dr. Laura Parahone, um, with her husband, Dr. David Parahone. And so she has really put together most of the curriculum for the practicum um, and has really, really worked um, a lot on developing out our community-based participatory research modules, our community um, uh, empowerment modules, and our education modules. So, so really the core modules have, have 
come from Dr. Laura and her and her colleagues and and the people who have been working for a long time in, in community based um, research and uh, our academic coordinator. Her name is Desiree uh, Sanabria, and she is actually in, in the United States right now getting her master's of social work. Um, so she couldn't call today. She's actually working on her thesis right now, so she's pretty busy. Um, and then our, our core team members are our technical research fellow. Um, so we're in the process of hiring this person right now, so that this would be someone who's in training. Um, but this person is going to be working really heavily within our grants team and on our monitoring evaluation team. So they, um, and also helping out a lot with the global health practicum in the years to come. We have our academic coordinator in training, who is a doctor at our clinic, and she also is a graduate from United World College. Um, her name is Dr. Azuela Medrano, and, and so she'll, she'll be with us. Um, I'm also part of the team, the monitoring and evaluation coordinator. And then we have our rural field experience coordinator, whose name is Felicia, and she has been coordinating um, partnerships um, out with rural, rural communities for, for many, many years. Um, of course, we also have our course instructors. Um, so we have our health promoter, Pedro Pablo, who you're going to visit in the rural community. We have Dr. Renee Kusler, and we have Elaine Fortin, who is, um, who is a public health specialist. We have Gabriel Setray, who's a, a historian and has an amazing module that I'm really excited for you guys to hear. We have Alejandra Mera, she works um, in our, on our finance team, but she also has her master's in business and administration, and she really is very knowledgeable about um, institutions and funding and global health, so she'll be giving us a, a lecture on that. Um, we have Alexis Siegel, who's actually a coordinator for the Peace Corps here in Nicaragua. Um, and has lived here for, for quite some time. We have John Carroll, who is in charge of our, our water sanitation and hygiene plan, as well as other community projects. So weeks one and three, we're at the Amos Conference Summit. Um, and so just during these weeks, we are sharing about our methodology. Um, we are, um, we're, we're going over community-based participatory research. We're talking about community-based primary health care, participatory evaluation, monitoring evaluation, the history of Nicaragua. So just really amazing both theoretical um, modules and also we have some really, really practical modules that will, can help you in your, in your future in global health, like such as survey development and some monitoring and evaluation. Um, I'm not going to share this video right now. Um, but we, we have a really amazing video of the guest house. So when you're on Amos's campus um, during weeks one and three, you're going to be staying at our guest house. And we have a really, really beautiful campus. We have um, actually like a path that you can run around to work out on um, in the mornings or in the evenings. Um, we, we have a gate. We have guards. Um, and and so it's really beautiful. Lots of flowers and we have yucca plants and papaya plants and just lots of stuff growing around. So that's where you'll be staying when you're here with us in Managua. Um, the second week, you will be going out to a rural, one of our rural community partners. Um, and you're going to be going to a community in Matagalpa. And the health promoter there is name is Pedro Pablo. And um, so during that week, we're going to be working on water sanitation and hygiene um, surveys. Um, so basically what that looks like is our, our communities, most of them have um, water filter programs. So we, we work with community members and what we call wash promoters in the communities to, to assure that everyone's water filter is, is working well, that they're maintaining their water filter, and that they're storing water properly. Um, as well as some educational modules like, um, you know, proper hand washing techniques and um, latrine placement in, in the yard and just different modules like that. Um, so so we'll, we'll be doing a wash survey, checking up on people's water filters with other community members. Um, we're going to be doing something that we call health stations, checking up on children's height, weight, and media status, and also um, having a brief interview with them their dietary diversity um, and then also we're going to be spending a lot of time with Pedro Pablo and asking him to share about his experience in his community 
um, asking him to, to demonstrate a home visit for us, um, asking him to share about his community graphs and his community maps. So you'll just, he's, he's honestly one of the, the best professors that we have in, in the health, um, in, in the whole global health practice. So you'll be learning from him and his health team. So now we're gonna go on to what you can expect in the community. And so this is a picture of our, one of our internship groups from last year. So um, some things that you can really expect in the community, um, most all the communities are really warm and welcoming. They'll invite you to play soccer, they'll invite you to play softball. Um, they'll, the kids will, will love playing with you. People will just love learning about you and, and I'm sure you guys will learn, love to learn about them as well. Um, so just be just be really excited for um, you know a, a really great time of connection um, with community members. Um, what you can really be expecting in, in the community at the time that you're going to be coming is it's our rainy season. So this is this is why we like we wanted to put this this picture. So things are going to be really muddy. Um, you can definitely expect to get rained on. So definitely bring your rain jacket. Um, we help everyone buy rain boots when they get here. So we'll either take you to a market and help you buy rain boots, or um, we'll stop on the way um, when we're going to the, the rural community. Um, so one thing that you should know about the Nicaraguan diet is it's really starch heavy. Um, so we eat a lot of rice and beans, we eat a lot of yuca, there's a lot of fried foods, um, so just, um, so it's really, really starch heavy. Um, some of you are vegetarians and, and we do our very absolute best um, to provide um, healthy meals for you, um, but sometimes the options are more limited for vegetarians. So I, I recommend um, you do bring your, your own snacks if you're, if you're a vegetarian or also if you're, if you're worried about um, getting tired of food or you need some extra supplements definitely bring your own snacks. Um, however, one word of caution is if you take out your snacks um, in, a, in a group of people, um, Nicaraguan culture is very caring and very sharing. So anyone, like for instance, I said my, my two best work friends at work are Nitsa and Gloria. And so we're always sharing food constantly. If someone opens something, it's, it's the attitude is it's everybody's. So, so if you bring snacks, I encourage you to eat them in a private place um, so, so that they remain your snacks, eat a lot, or you can bring enough for all of us, and that will be great. Um, another thing you can expect are bucket showers. So there is a lack of, of running water um, in the community. So what we usually do is construct, um, as you can, can, can see here in the picture, we'll construct a shower um, made out of plastic um, if there is in the shower um, in the community. So, so, and there's not a shower actually in Sabalete. Um, so we will be constructing one of these showers with the plastic tarping. Um, then you'll use the bucket to pour water over yourself and to scrub yourself down. Um, so just, just, be, just be prepared for that. Um, this is a picture of a very, very nice latrine. Um, most of the latrines, unfortunately, don't look like that. Um, but you will be using latrines. Um, so some key rules are you can put the toilet paper inside the latrine or oftentimes there will be like a, um, a waste basket by the latrine and then never the latrine because it's just really uh, probably unsanitary. We were, we're all going to be staying in close quarters. Um, men and women are going to be separated out into different rooms, um, but, but we will be in very close quarters sleeping on cots next to each other. Um, we ask you to bring your own sleeping bag, um, and we'll get to it a little bit later, but I encourage you to buy, um, there's a specific type of bug net that's really amazing and actually looks like a tent that, that will really protect you. So we encourage you to buy that bug net if, if you would like to. It's a little bit on the expensive side, but it works really, really well. Um, if not, you can bring, go ahead and bring a mosquito. If not, we can help you get one when you get here um, because they sell a lot of, there's a lot of options for mosquito nets at, at the markets. Okay, great. So um, as for transportation to the rural communities, we we use these heavy duty off vehicles um, to get to where we're going because uh, most of the communities um, 
don't, there's paved roads um, for most of the ride, but a lot of times right before we get to the communities, there's no paved roads. And so in, in the rainy season, they get really muddy. Um, so so we, we have to, to have these heavy duty um, off-roading vehicles um, that we'll all be riding in. Um, so we, um, Nicaragua is an amazing, amazing country. I'm really excited to, for those of you who haven't traveled here um, to come experience it. So Managua is situated in between two colonial cities and one of them is pictured here, um, the big yellow, with the picture with the big yellow church. Um, and the other one is called Leon. Um, and they're just amazing cities. Um, Leon has a lot of volcanoes to hike around it if you're interested in that. Um, at the top right picture, you're, you'll see the Laguna de Apoyo. So that's a freshwater crater lake um, that we're actually all going to together for, the, for our, what we call our retreat after going to one of the rural communities. Um, at the bottom picture, you can see one of our active volcanoes, which is volca uh, Masaya Volcano. Um, and it's also really close by to Managua. There's, just, like, there's um, tons of volcanoes to hike if you're interested in that. There's a really beautiful canyon up in northern Nicaragua called the Simoto Canyon. If you like, you know, kind of jumping off rocks and like, you know, through the water. Um, there's the beautiful mountainous region in, nor in the north of Nicaragua. So you're be bored for, you know, a single day um, while you're here. So those tourist experiences, um, just a word of caution, we will, apart from the retreat that we will be having to um, Laguna de Apoyo, you guys are gonna be on your own to plan your tourist experiences. So therefore we really encourage you um, to, to buy a Nicaraguan phone. And we have cards that will be ready for you when you get here of safe taxi numbers to use, instructions how to use the buses, the bus system here in Nicaragua, and, and just you know very other, various contact information that you'll find really useful. But you will be in charge of planning your own tourist experiences. None of our team will, will, will be able to do that for you. So if you need to call hostels or taxis, you'll, you'll be um, doing that on your own. Um, so for, for flights, most of you guys are right, or everyone is arriving June 3rd. Um, and so we're going to have a morning and afternoon airport pickup time. We'll be sending you more details about this, but usually um, we schedule kind of the, the morning pickup for around 10 a.m. and the afternoon pickup will be around three or four. So sometimes you might have to wait um, a little bit of time. Um, but we really look at everyone's flights. We're, we're going to ask you guys to all send in your flight information, and then we'll we'll re redefine the times that we'll be we'll be picking you guys up at the airport. So don't worry, we'll be picking you up at the airport. Um, special circumstances, like maybe someone's getting in really late, or their flight um, got canceled or delayed, we'll be sent. We'll send a safe taxi to come get you. Um, but just know you up at the airport and more information is coming about this once we get all of your flight information. So we'll be asking for that too very soon. Um, so when you arrive in Nicaragua, you're going to have to to pay a $10 fee to enter the country. Um, and it's right when you, when you go through customs and they'll ask you, you know, to fill out the customs form and you pay $10 and you get a stamp in your passport. And you'll also get like this little piece of paper that also has the stamp on it as well. Um, so just for, for your records, and, and we'll send this presentation to you all as well, but for your records, the Amos physical address is, is listed here on the PowerPoint. Um, so, so you'll need to know that when you're, when you're filling out your paperwork um, to come through customs. So let us like what the Nicaraguan money looks like. It's, it's really beautiful um, and, and the exchange rate is one US dollar to a little over 31 um, Cordobas. So the Nicaraguan money is called Cordobas. Um, so you can use, there's a lot of really good banking institutions here in Nicaragua. The, the, the most common ones um, that, that are really safe to use are BAC, B-A-C Bank, um, Banpro, B-A-N-P-R-O, um, and LAFISE, L-A-I-S-E. 
So you you and we have these banks um, near near Amos. Like you probably will have to take a taxi or something called the Caponera to to go to the the banks here. Um, but you, you should have no problem withdrawing money. There will be an ATM fee um, to withdraw money. Most banks have those, um, so just be aware of that. But but you should have easy access to withdraw money. Um, it's really common here to use U.S. dollars. So you actually don't need to, to buy um, any, any foreign currency before you arrive here. You can just take it out, start taking it out of the banks when you get here. You can bring cash in U.S. dollars and people um, exchange it, you know, when you buy a bottle of water or snacks or whatever, they'll, they'll be able to exchange it. Um, so, so yeah, U.S. dollars are, are, are used really widely here. However, if you bring U.S. dollars, I recommend you bring smaller bills. So bring, you know, 10s and 20s as opposed to 100s because a lot of places will not accept 50 or $100 bills. So, so 20s are the way to go if you come over with U.S. money. Okay, so um, I know Sharon has already sent you guys the packing checklist. So one thing I just wanted to, to specify really quickly is the packing checklist we sent you it's usually one that we work a lot with church groups here. So that was actually one that we usually send to our church groups. So it does have on there like bring your Bible, which does not apply to you guys. If you want to bring your Bible, you are more than welcome to do that. However, it's not a requirement. Um, it's the Global Health Practicum. Although Amos is a Christian organization, the Global Health Practicum is a, is a really um, secular program that we have. So, so don't feel pressured at all to bring your Bible or anything like that. Um, another thing that was on that checklist was about your swimsuit. Um, more than welcome to wear it, um, girls, if, if you would want to. Um, just a word of warning though, Nicaragua overall is a more conservative country, so you just might get a little bit more depending on where you're going, if you're in a bikini. Um, but, but for instance, Laguna de Apoyo is really touristy, so you should be absolutely fine wearing your bikini there. All the beaches are, are pretty so is bringing um, not necessarily for the people only participating in the global health practicum, although it's highly recommended. Um, but for the internships, it's definitely required that you bring. Um, but like I was just saying, the most important thing is really to bring your computer, especially if you're in the internships. Health practicum, highly recommend you bring your computer, but you could probably also get by with a tablet uh, if you're just in the global health practicum. However, those who are only participating in the global health practicum will also still have you analyze some data um, from our WASH surveys and from our health stations. Um, so, so, like I said, bringing a computer is, is, is probably the best idea. Um, and we also have a Pinterest page that you guys can check out for, for some non-essential packing ideas if, if you would like to, and the link is posted here. Um, one thing that's, that, that is a really good idea is to bring, you know, maybe have your big suitcase that you, you pack, you know, a lot of different clothes in, and then have a backpack, maybe like a backpacking backpack or like a, a, like a larger, day pack or backpack that you pack all of your clothes that you're going to take to the campo uh, or the rural areas with you so so you can leave most of your clothes at the guest house um when you're in the rural areas and just pack a smaller bag to go to the rural areas um so that's that's definitely um what i recommend but if if you've ever been backpacking and you kind of i think they're like maybe 30 gallons and uh, if you if you have one of those that's really perfect to bring to the rural areas. Okay, so if you wanna go the extra mile when you're packing, these are, uh, most of these things are non-essential, but I, I highly, highly recommend the sands bug. It looks like a tent, but it really does a great job of protecting you from mosquito bites. Um, so this isn't on the packing list, but I recommend the sands bug. You can find some similar options probably on Amazon. But, but these work really, really well. Um, another thing that I really like to use when I go to the, the rural areas is um, a pad to put on my cot. So it, it, the cots are pretty uncomfortable. Um, so I highly recommend you bring a, a pad to put on, you know, under your sleeping bag 
or you might just want to sleep on top of your sleeping bag and you can bring like an extra blanket to cover up with at night. It's the area we're going to does get a little bit cool. A headlamp is a must. So please put that list um, to get a headlamp because, um, you know, a lot of times you, some people might be showering at night. And so it's really good to have that headlamp. Sometimes you might have to go to the latrine at night. Um, so, so that's really essential. And then also in this picture, these are kind of the examples of what I was talking about of the backpacks that you might want to take to the rural areas. And um, those are just some. Um, just so you get an idea. Um, so when you're on Amos, it's really light business casual. So sometimes we might wear Amos t-shirts, jeans. Um, don't wear shirts, try to wear not sleeves, but just that aren't tank tops. So we or longer shorts or skirts um, to be in our offices um, because you will be in the um, when you come to the office, we just kindly ask you to be, you know, not super business professional, but but, but wear, you know, maybe pants and nicer shirts when you're in our office, taking the fur. Yeah, just when you're, when you're in our office. So um, this is what we look like when, you, when we dress in the compo. Um, this uh, lady right here was one of our interns. I think, um, the one who was holding the poster was one of our interns last year. And so this is really appropriate clothing. I'll probably wear some pants that are quick dry pants. Um, uh, definitely we don't, we ask people to not wear shorts when they're in the rural communities. We ask you to not wear tank tops when you're in the rural communities because it is a little, it's more conservative dress. Um, so please, um, please think along those terms, kind of like, um, a camping style of dress almost, just because a lot of times we're going to be walking really far every day. Um, it, it'll be comfortable, it'll dry quickly, and it's also modest. Um, so if you have any questions about that, please, please, please feel free to chat me in the chat box. This is a photo of how we you know just when we're when we're having fun outside of work. So you can see it's it's pretty much how you you guys probably dress. Um, in the States. So feel free to wear whatever you want when, um, you know, you're visiting those tourist areas. Um, yeah, so, so this is just kind of an example. And so once again, um, when you're wearing, uh, if you are, do decide to wear shorts and maybe more revealing clothing when you're on your own terms, um, maybe traveling around, just be very aware that on the public transportation, like the buses, that will cause a lot of attention to you, that will draw a lot of attention to you. Um, so I would just be very aware, especially when you're using public transportation, um, and, and maybe consider wearing pants or longer shorts or a skirt or something um, if you're using public transportation. If you're traveling in a private taxi, um, you should definitely feel pretty free to wear um, whatever you want. But, but yeah, just, just always, I think the best thing to do is just to be really aware of your environment and, and, you know, always, you know, take, take the safety option, right? Always be more safe than sorry. So some dress don't, and I think I already hit most of these, but just to reiterate them, please don't wear short shorts on Amos's campus or in the communities. So, um, you know, last year, some of our end would wear really short shorts on the Amos campus when, and it was on their own, it was on their leisure time, but still when people are working in the offices and you need to run around our trail that goes around our campus, that does sometimes uh, make people in our offices feel uncomfortable if you're wearing really, really short workout shorts. Um, so please be, just, just be a little bit considerate about that and about the people that you're around. Um, so underwear is another very sensitive thing here. So, um, you know, a lot of the girls last year would, you know, wash their underwear and then hang it to dry. And then our whole staff would see it hanging out to dry. Um, so I would just 
caution you, be aware of this. We do have people that can wash your clothes for you. And I, I highly recommend you take that option because it's a really cheap option. Um, but we do have, you know, um, someone can wash and dry your clothes for you if, if you decide to do that here. However, if you do decide to wash your clothes on your own, just um, I would, I would, we can work with the guest house coordinator to find a place for you to privately hang your clothes um, because people did uh, complain about that last year. Um, and like I said, you can wear bikinis, just not in the communities. So when we're in the rural communities, please no bikinis and not on Amos campus, but I don't think you would have any reason to wear a bikini on the Amos campus. Um, yeah, so that's, and please, like I said, feel free to, to send any chats there. Um, sorry, I'm waiting for the slide to, to change. And, and I, I see a lot of people asking questions in the chat box, and I just want to assure you that I'll get to those um, at, the, at the end when we're, when we're um, uh, at the Q&A section. I'll go back and, and answer those questions before opening it up to you guys in the videos. So a little bit about Sea Nicaragua. Um, the taxis in, in, in Managua always have um, a number. So you can see that number M04515. So a taxi that is a legitimate taxi will always have one of those numbers. And then um, one thing to do is always check the license plate. So if the license plate, it has an M on it. And that M signifies that that taxi is from Managua. Um, so if you're in Managua, you wanna find, you wanna make sure that you find a taxi that is from Managua. Because if there, they, there might be one that says G on it and that taxi is from Granada. And so if you're in Managua, driving around Managua, you, you don't want a taxi that's from another city because they might charge you um, more or they might not know where they're going and you could, could get you lost. So be very aware of that. Always look for the, the registration number, which is right there, and then always check the license plate. And it, it's from the city that you're currently in. So if you're in like Leon, for instance, I think their license plates all say L's on them. So just, just be aware of that. Um, the red um, moto taxi to the right of the car is called the Capo. And I, I think a lot of you guys have already traveled to Central America. So in most other countries, they call these tuk tuks, um, but, but here we call them caponeras and they're moto taxis. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're safe to, to drive around in. The, you usually use the caponeras um, on side streets. So for instance, Amos is located inside of a community. So a lot of times you guys will use the caponeras to get out of Amos and get to the main road. And then after you get to the main road, you might take a taxi or you might take a bus to go somewhere else that you want to go to. Um, so those are a really common mode of transportation. And these two caponeras take, um, you know, they're really cheap. So, um, and, we'll, and we'll talk more about those prices when you get here, um, but they, they shouldn't be charging you very much. You know, at most it's usually a dollar um, maximum to get where you want to go because they actually can't go that far with you. Um, and then finally, at the bottom picture, that's a, a microbus. So there's two different buses in Chicago. We have the smaller buses that look like vans, and then we have larger buses that look like old school buses. So a, a lot of um, old school buses in the United States actually make their way to Central America, and sometimes they're painted really bright colors um, and things like that. Um, so the, the microbuses, these vans, are usually a little bit more expensive than the large chicken buses. So it's really cheap. Like, um, for instance, to get from Managua to Granada, a beautiful colonial city, um, in, in one of these microbuses, the vans. And so just to reiterate, if you guys want to do any traveling on the weekends, you'll be um, arranging your own travel just apart from when we go to the day of Pollo together. Okay, so just um, some, some safety precautions. We recommend that you guys don't carry around expensive jewelry or large cameras or have your phones in your hands um, when you're walking around um, it, or in your pockets either. Um, or if you are putting something in your pocket, just, just make sure you're very aware of it. Um, if you girls, if you or or anyone who likes to carry um, a purse, um, if you 
if you do have a purse, we recommend it is a purse that zips and not one that just buttons because the ones that just button are really, really easy to get into. So if you are carrying around a purse, make sure it zips. Um, I recommend purses that have inside pockets so you can put one into the pockets. So maybe it's really hard to access. Um, if you're buses, uh, definitely if you have any valuables with you, you wanna be holding those at all times. So the buses have places where you can store things above your head but we recommend that you just hold those at all times um, in your lap if, if you're traveling on the buses. Okay, so um, I, I think Sharon has already sent you this information and if she hasn't, um, just let me know in the chat box, chat box, but we have a travel guide document for you, a packing checklist, health information, um, travel preparations for coming to Nicaragua, and then we ask you for a copy of your traveler's insurance. Um, so these are a few of the things that we're gonna be talking about in this next section. Um, we're also gonna be asking you for a volunteer code of conduct, which looks like this. So we have you read it and sign it and send it to us. Um, so just, just be aware. Uh, can someone let me know if Sharon has already sent that to you? Okay, great, great. Okay, so you guys already have that. So the sooner that you can get that in, the better. Um, we have, you know, files for you guys and we'll be going through those within the next couple of weeks and letting you know um, what we don't have from you. So for health tips, I highly recommend that you guys go ahead and visit a travel doctor before you come down here. Um, so usually your the clinic at your university will have someone that you can make an appointment with and, 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 and that doctor can basically go over the, the recommendations from the centers uh, for disease control with you and kind of check to see if you need any additional vaccinations or, or anything like that. Um, so uh, you can also just check the CDC's website, which we have listed here for the travel recommendations that we have for coming down to Nicaragua. Um, so, for instance, yellow fever has not come to Nicaragua yet. However, um, if you are traveling or have traveled recently to Colombia uh, or Brazil or any of the countries right now that are, are having a problem with yellow fever, you will need to have proof that you've had the vaccination. Um, so, so if you plan on traveling to those countries anytime soon before you come to Nicaragua, Nicaragua actually won't let you into the country until you've pro you prove that you have that vaccination. Um, um, the places that we're going to in the rural areas in Matagalpa, they want um, malaria there in, in those communities. However, in other parts of the country of, uh, of Nicaragua, in the, the uh, it's called the Rax, which is the southern autonomous region of Nicaragua and the northern autonomous region of Nicaragua. There, there have been rising cases of malaria. So, um, it, you know, I, I always recommend because you guys are here for such a short period of time to, to consider getting on the malaria prophylaxis. Um, and, and you can talk to your doctor about that and analyze the, the pros and cons of that. Um, but I, I highly recommend it. So I'm not really gonna spend too much time on this. Um, you will find that we have um, repellent stations um, all around our campus so that you can spray yourselves um, with repellent to avoid getting bitten by mosquitoes. Um, mosquitoes really are more of a problem in the urban centers of Nicaragua. So it's really interesting, but mosquitoes actually can't fly that far in, in one day. Um, so Zika hit the, the, the cities the hardest in Nicaragua because mosquitoes have a limited, um, you know, basically flight span in a day. So, so that's why it's, it's more of a problem in the city. Also, people are store water in the city. So there's uh, water outages in the city. And so people store water and that ends up becoming like a mosquito breeding site. Um, so, so, you know, the mosquitoes that really carry Zika and dengue are really a lot more prevalent in the cities than they are in the rural areas. Um, however, we recommend that, you know, when you take precaution and bring your own, your own bug spray, but also know that we have bug spray stations around Emus um, when you're on campus. We also really recommend that you go ahead and buy one of those 
those nice bug nets, the, the sans bug, if you can. However, if you can't, um, you can buy a mosquito net when you get here to, to Nicaragua, or you can find a cheaper one in the States, maybe through Amazon, and they can mail it to you. Um, so we, um, at Amos, we have a, a list of needs um, that, that is linked here in this document. If any of you feel so inclined um, to, to donate to us, um, from our list of needs, we would be so grateful for you, and 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 a lot of it will probably go into to helping with maybe even crafts or something like that um, when we're in the rural communities with the kiddos. Um, for the health stations, I'm sorry, this says Pila Grande. That is a mistake in Sa Sabalete. We need 200 lancets and 150 hemocuvettes to take the anemia um, uh, tests. Um, so, so we'll be sending more information about that. We would really love it if, if someone could consider, you know, donating that because that, that would be a huge help to us. However, if, if no one can, we'll, we'll be purchasing we'll a volunteer to bring the lancets and the hemocubets because they're really, really expensive to buy here in Nicaragua. Uh, finally, I know Sharon sent the 2018 participants list. Um, so please fill that out. And that's uh, also where you fill out whether you want the binder or not for the global health practice. Okay, so now going on to um, the internship of the logistics information session. Okay, so um, this is our organic grammar for the internships um, at Amos. So overseeing all of our internships are Dr. Laura Parajon and our uh, Premier Healthcare Programs Director, Dr. Dr. Gabriela. Uh, and so, you know, when we're planning these projects, we're helping our global health community with the communities and talk to community leaders and also think about sustainability plans for after things are gone and like how we can secure more funding and things like that. Um, I, I have directly um, helped in the planning of all of the internships um, as the monitoring and evaluation coordinator, and I will have um, coordinated meetings with each of the internship groups weekly um, because the monitoring and evaluation team really, really needs to know um, just everything that you guys are doing so that we can really follow up and also have access to all the data that you guys are going to be collecting. Um, for the early childhood development, uh, program and we have already sent you guys that your internship placements um, So if, if you don't know those just go ahead and message me and I can follow up with you in an email But everyone should have their placements. So for the early um, One unique thing. I'll just back up a little bit. We have uh, there's a lot of staff and mentor um, Personnel to student ratio to students ratio. So you're gonna have you know, really great access to some experts and to, some, and to community leaders and to EMA staff. So for the early childhood development internship, um, your mentors are Drs. Joe and Denise DiPrano, and they currently work um, in Cleveland at the Cleveland Clinic and at Rainbow Children's Hospital, um, but they have been working alongside EMAS as volunteers for a really, really long time and they're also specialists in, in pediatric development. Um, so they're really amazing. They helped out with the, our early childhood development program last year. The coordinator for this is gonna be Desiree, um, and she is um, currently getting her master's in social work, and she has a really um, you know, big focus on early childhood development within her master's in social work. And finally, your preceptor, and so the preceptors are the AMIS staff members who also have public health experience who will be kind of, who will essentially be ensuring that the project is meeting high uh, public health standards and, and we're touching on those core competencies in public health. So that preceptor is Dr. Zoila Medrano. Um, so all of these people are gonna be working with you and overseeing your project. Uh, finally, for the Youth Empowerment Project, your mentor is Dr. Kristen Johnson-Martin. She's the director of, of a clinic in the United States, and she has huge, 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 huge um, experience, you know, working with family planning and teen pregnancy and community, just um, community primary health care. Um, so she's going to be a great mentor. Um, the coordinators, the AMS staff members who will be coordinating your internship are Lester Lorente, 
and he's actually um, our, our manager for our Zika project. So we have um, our Zika project is covering an area of 50,000 people um, right now in Managua and he's overseeing that project, but he also um, helped to oversee the project that was completed last year. Um, and he's and he's really um, we're transitioning the Zika project to work more with youth now. Um, so so that's why he's in this project. We actually had an inauguration today, which is which is really cool. So everyone check the the Facebook, uh, the Amos Facebook. We had an inauguration today of what we call the Seabird Box, and it's a place where teens can come and learn about sex ed, but also they're they they're learning computer skills at the same time because that was a really big need that they listed um, and, and an area of growth that they wanted in the communities. And so um, the coordinators are Lester and Yanira, and she's our, our youth empowerment coordinator in Managua. And then finally, I will be your, your public health preceptor for, for the youth empowerment. Um, finally, for the gender equity project that's going to the rural areas, Dr. Laura, Dr. Laura Pazman is going to be your mentor and your preceptor. Um, so she'll be overseeing the public health competencies of your work. And then the coordinators are going to be Petronilo, who is the, 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 the health promoter in that area, and Yadira y Rosa Bilinda, and they're also health promoters. So you'll be working really closely with them. And then you'll also be working with Milton and Socorro, who are our rural healthcare team supervisors. So you have a pretty big team there. Um, also, the two internships that are working in the urban areas, the early childhood development and the youth internships, you're going to be working really closely with health promoters as well in, in, in our urban community, but they're called Consejeras de Salud. So you, everyone's really working very closely with health promoters. Um, so just to touch on IRB and ethics training, so one recommendation um, for the youth and gender equity groups, I, I recommend that you apply for an expedited IRB or non-research IRB um, for, for this program, because you will be interacting with people, you will be collecting data, um, we will be sending you the list of activities that we'll be doing. It's, it's currently being um, checked over by our, our, our program staff, but once they have approved it, we can send you the, all the list of activities that you're going to be doing each day um, within the internships. Um, so, so highly recommend for those two internships to apply for an expedited IRB or a non-research IRB. Um, for the early childhood development team, your IRB is already taken care of. Desiree is actually um, is writing her thesis based on this project. So she has an IRB through her university and she can add you guys to her IRB. Um, however, she needs you guys to complete the PHRP training, um, which I have linked there. It's from the National Institutes of Health and it's an ethics training. So she needs you to complete this training and send her your certificate um, so that she can add you to her IRB. And so IRB, sorry, I didn't specify that. I'm, I'm sure most of you guys know, but it's the Institutional Review, Review Board. So it's an ethics board that just basically assures that your research um, is meeting ethical standards. Um, so that's for the early childhood development. Um, for the other internships, the youth and gender equity groups, we recommend you also complete this PHRP training. If you decide not to complete the PHRP training, or maybe your university has an equivalent training, I really need you to, to email me um, whatever, whatever program you use, your ethics training certificate. Um, and I've linked my email there. So everyone must complete an ethics training and send me your certificate. However, the early childhood development team has to complete the PHRP training. Even if you already have a different, um, um, different, uh, you know, ethics review training for the, the, the early childhood development, you have to complete the PHRP training to be added to the, the IRB. Um, yeah, and so the deadline to send me these ethics review or the ethics training certificates is on May 4th. So please complete your ethics review training by May 4th. If you have a problem um, with that date, just please shoot me an email and we, and we can work something out. But, but please complete that. Um, so we'll be sending you a link to our Facebook page. And so this is the resource where all of our past interns 
um, are, are located. So you guys can, you know, feel free to ask any questions and um, things like that to our previous interns and our previous global health uh, practicum participants. Um, a lot of times, you know, when we're commuting, commun communicating here in Nicaragua, we'll either use maybe the Facebook page, um, of course, email the Facebook page or WhatsApp. Um, so, so um, I highly recommend getting getting WhatsApp um, to be in contact with people because it, it works off of Wi-Fi. Um, but but just be on the lookout for an invitation to join our Facebook page. And so now is the time um, where we will, you know, go through the questions that you guys have already shared and open up the floor um, for for some more questions. And Matt also asked, will, we, will you guys have access to a gym or somewhere to run? So, so yes, on Emis's compound, on, on Emis's campus, there is a trail um, that goes around the whole campus and I think it's uh, about a mile. It's a little less than a mile. Um, so you can definitely run around there. Um, there is, you know, some pretty big porch space um, on, on one of our guest houses. So if you like to do insanity or if you like to do, um, uh, you know, what, I can't remember what the P90X or any of those kind of video workouts, you can feel free to do those there. We've had interns do that in the past. Um, we've had interns do yoga before. Um, so, so there's ample space for you guys to work out if you want to. Um, there's also a gym close by, um, but you would have to transport yourself there um, every day. Um, and, and so that might be a hassle because you'd probably take a couple in here to get out of Enos and then later you'd either take a bus or a taxi. Okay, so Taylor asks, is the yellow book proof of yellow fever vaccination sufficient to get through customs? I was recently in South America. Um, Taylor, can you send me a picture of that? And if anyone else has that, if you could just send me maybe a picture or a scan of that and I can check it over with one of our doctors to make sure that it, that it is sufficient to get through customs. Thank you. Oh. Thanks, Sylvia, for saying that you can bring the lancets and the hemo cuvettes. That would be such a big help. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and email you um, about that privately. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, one question is, you mentioned, just, you mentioned purchasing a phone in country. If we decided to purchase an international phone plan, would this be sufficient for in-country communication? If not, how much does a phone cost in country? So great question. Um, I think it really depends on your international phone plan. Um, so when I first got to Nicaragua, I had an international plan, Verizon, and that international phone plan was awful. Like you could, you could barely make data, you could make, you know, you could use, I think, 100 texts a month. Um, things like that. So I think it really just depends on what your international phone plan is. I think T-Mobile has a really good international phone plan, if I'm not mistaken. But I would just, I would just really check in with what your international phone plan is. Um, if you, if you do want to buy a phone in country, we call them chicleros. They're like these little, um, like, like small phones like uh, it would be like maybe I, I'm, I'm I think I might be older than all of you guys but I'm just thinking about what you know where I was in eighth grade and we had like these like Motorola little like phones that weren't even flip phones yet so you could buy those types of phones um um at the at the airport and they are like 20 bucks and you can put on like 10 or so uh, dollars worth of what we call salad um, so that's that's basically your minutes, and it's called saldo, S-A-L-D-O. So Rachel is asking if the ethics training is that only for interns. Um, Rachel, yeah, yeah, it's it's only for interns, but it's a really great it's really great to have an ethics training um, under your belt. Um, so I I would recommend that the global health practicum participants do it. But it's only required for the intern. Great question. Okay, so Taylor is asking our scrubs. Acceptable to wear in the rural communities. Yeah, we're just fine. They're actually pretty lightweight and comfortable. Um, yeah, one of our, our long-term volunteers, she always wears scrubs in the rural communities. That's perfectly fine. Um, Jonda asks, um, I'm arriving a couple days before to spend the weekend with family there. What time should I arrive to Amos on June So um, we really actually don't start anything on, on you know, until later that day. 
we will have a time where we get to know each other, but that's after all the flights arrive. I know everyone's flight schedule. I can, I can message you um, our estimated um, time that we're going to start, you know, just having a little get to know you session, but it'll be later in the evening. So like, um, you know, after dinner sometime, maybe like seven or eight at night is usually when it's, when it's been in the past. Great questions, guys. Any other questions? How will our time be divided when we're there? And so for the, just the global health practicum, you spend the very first week at Amos, then the second week you go out to the rural communities, and then the third week you're back at Amos again. Um, for the internships, you'll be going out to the rural communities for two weeks for, for, the, for the, the group that is in the gender equity project. You'll go out to the, to the rural communities for a total of two weeks during the internship period. But it, it's like um, we're having a training for one week at Amos for that specific internship. And then you'll go out to the rural communities early, and you'll come back to Amos and work because you'll probably need some internet to work on the things um, that, that we imagine you to work on because you're going to be helping us to develop some curriculum. And then you'll go back out to the rural intern or the rural areas again to pilot the, the curriculum and then you'll come back to Amos. So it's kind of like a rotating schedule. So one out in the community, one back in Amos, one out, one back in. Oh, um, for a single day, how long would it be? Like, is there a specific time where when do we start working and when do we stop? Uh -huh, yeah, so work schedule for the day. Um, generally, um, it, you'll start around 8 a.m. and then you'll get off around 4.30 or 5 every day. So it's about a 40-hour work week. Do we have to get the HEP A and tetanus shot? Um, I, I, I recommend it. So for definitely for the tetanus shot, um, you know, when we're walking around the rural areas, a lot of times you have to like crawl over barbed wire or crawl under barbed wire. And, you know, sometimes there's like nails in the latrines that you, like I've accidentally hit my head on a nail before. So I definitely recommend if you're not up to date on your tetanus shot, go ahead and, and get the booster. Um, to become up to date on your tetanus shot. So yeah, so yeah, those are the HEPA and the tetanus are a must if you're not up to date. That's asking for interns not on the gender equity team. Will be, we be in the rural community during the five weeks post practicum? No, you will not. You guys are working in Nehapa, which is the community that is urban outside of Manaus. A lot of communities. Um, like it's, you know, where Amos is, we're on a dirt road. Um, people have really limited access to clean water. Um, it's just not as quite as dispersed as the rural areas, but you will be here in Nehapa. And packing wise for the time that we would be in Nehapa, um, I guess clothes wise, dress wise, is it all right to follow how we would dress in the rural community or the office is more Okay, and then the next question is appropriate dress for Nehapa. Um, is it like the office or like the campo? So when you're walking around Nehapa and, and doing surveys, um, Catalina, I'm not sure. Oh, well, I'll just go. I'll just go over both of the internship groups. So the um, there will be a period of time where both the youth empowerment and the early childhood development groups are both going to be walking around Nehapa a lot. So it's hot, um, you're probably gonna get rained on at some point. So, so when you're walking around, it's definitely uh, more like how you adjust to the combo. You probably wanna wear your tennis shoes, you wanna wear some light um, weight pants that might dry quickly in case you get rained on. You might you know, wanna wear like more of like an athletic shirt because it's more comfortable and like uh, maybe if you're sweating a lot, it helps you in that way. Um, so I would say like, a lot of it will be more like the compo. Um, however, there will be for the youth empowerment group, um, you guys are going to be leading focus group sessions. So in those focus group sessions, I would recommend that you dress more like the office. Um, and then also both of those groups are going to, you know, be having assemblies with the community and presenting to our health uh, consejeras. And so uh, during those presentations, I would recommend that you dress for your Great question. Um, what 
And Brittany asks, what is the setup for the lodge? Is it dorm style? So yes, the, the, the Amos guest house is dorm style. So we have bunk beds um, for you guys to, to be sharing. And there is not air conditioning. Um, there technically is air conditioning in house. However, you guys are not, it's not included in your fee. Um, so there will be, the air conditioning won't be turned on. Um, if, if everyone wants to get together and turn on the air conditioner, it's pretty expensive. Um, but we can work out something with the air conditioner together. But it, 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 there won't be air conditioning. There will be fans, just no air conditioning. Um, Jay is asking, do I need to buy some personal items like water filter? So you will always have access to uh, filtered water at Amos. So there's really no need to buy any of those uh, self-filtering water bottles. However, if you would like to, I mean, that always is, you know, it always um, gives you that extra security, of course, if, if you're interested. But you'll always have access to filtered water. Um, I did have a question. I don't know if you would have the answer, but... For the rest of our fees, um, can we continue doing um, online payments or does it have to be in check? Yeah, so I think the online payment would work, but I, I'm gonna write, I'm writing down your question right now and um, I will check in with our volunteer coordinator. Um, just so, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll, we'll get back to you. And sorry, who was that asking the question? Michelle. Michelle. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Yeah, uh, and I'll send out um, a blast to, to everybody else about that, but, but let me check on that and get back to you. Um, so we have another question, a couple of questions. So how many people to a room? Um, usually, like for instance, we have some of our guest house rooms are really big. So sometimes there's like 20 people to a room. Um, However, I'm not sure exactly what rooms you guys are staying in. I'd, I'd have to ask the guest house coordinator to, to find out the exact um, number of people. So there's usually like a range between six people to about 20 people in, in a room. Um, so, so no one gets a private room, but, but and, and there will be bunk beds. Um, so what about water in the rural communities? So for the rural communities, we bring filtered water and we also have water filters. So we have uh, a water filter program at Amos. So we, we use those water filters to filter water when we're out in the rural communities. Great questions, you guys. Um, then there's a question, will there be a food stipend? So no, there's not a food stipend, but your food is prepared for you. So at the guest house, um, all, all of your meals are to go to the rural communities with us who will prepare all of our food. Um, so, so that is all taken care of, care of for you. However, if you decide to travel on the weekends, those travel expenses are, are you consume, uh, like you, you have to be responsible for those, those travel um, expenses. So if you decide to eat out on the weekends or at like any night, or um, if you travel on the weekends and, and want to stay at a hostel or you want to, you know, eat out, you have to pay for that and then pay for that. Um, it's like a quiet area if I need to study a computer lab. So that's a really interesting question. I haven't thought about that. So there, in general, in the guest house, there, there's a lot of space. So I think you could find your, 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 your class. Have a serenity garden to on the Amos campus. And then like I, was, I, I mentioned earlier, we just put in a class at Amos called the Seabird Ball. And so, I mean, it might be occupied with youth from the community um, because uh, they come in after school and use the computers, but that will be a place that you could potentially study into. Is our, our, it's actually a converted storage container, like one of those big storage containers that I think everyone is not like making restaurants out of, but it's, it's one of those. So you could potentially study in there. So um, were the leggings in the communities? So um, that's a really good question. So I would say when you're walking around the communities, I, I wouldn't recommend the leggings, especially in the rural areas, because like I said, you might be ducking under a barbed wire to get to different houses. And those are really easy to tear if you accidentally nick yourself with barbed wire. Um, so I wouldn't recommend the leggings um, in the rural communities. I also wouldn't recommend them walking around in a 
because it's just not as not super appropriate. Um, people in the book dress really, really nice. Like everyone here is like really fashionable. I feel, you know, so inadequate all the time. So um, people dress really, really nicely. Um, so I don't, I think leggings would, would probably, and I asked for some clarity for some of, from some of my coworkers, but I, I would recommend you not wearing leggings in the communities. Um, maybe, you know, at night, like before you go to sleep or if you're going to work out in the communities or if you're working out on Amos campus, leggings are totally fine. But however, if you're walking and meeting people in the communities, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, within the compound. Um, appropriate running clothes for women are, you can definitely wear leggings, um, just, just for the shorts, just, I, I would, I would make them a little bit longer shorts. Um, not like knee length or anything, just like, so that they cover your, your butt. Um, and then, yeah, and then leggings are fine if you're wanting to run around the compound. Are there any challenges to living there that you might not expect? That's a really good question. I have to think back. So I've been living here for over two years now. So I think I've forgotten some of those things. I think um, one thing would be about the transportation. So where you're located is you're inside of a community in Nehapa. And so it's just a little bit hard sometimes to get to, to places in the city because you have to take a caponera or a tuk-tuk out and then you either have to get a taxi or a bus. So it's just a little bit hard uh, traveling because we don't have Uber here um, or Lyft or anything. Um, so, so I think that's something that's hard um, for most people. Um, another hard you, you might feel limited uh, walking kind of around at night. So, so like if you're going out into the city to go eat at a restaurant or anything like that, you're totally fine, especially if you're in, your, in, your, in a group. So we always recommend that people go out in groups together. Like if you're wanting to explore, if you're wanting to travel, always go in a group. Um, definitely don't recommend going by yourself. It's just always helpful to have extra pair of eyes and, and everything. Um, so I think that might be hard for some people is like maybe losing like a little bit of autonomy. Um, but it's, you know, the forest to you, um, to most of you. And, and um, so just always be careful, always travel in groups. Um, so one question is in regards to rain boots, is it better to buy them in Managua or is it all right to bring our own if we already have some? So it's totally okay to already bring your own rain boots. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Bring your own rain boots. For a lot of rain boots that our interns have bought in the past, uh, not as heavy duty as my be necessary for Nicaragua. So just make sure that if you have rain boots, the is pretty thick and, and they look pretty durable and they, and they don't look too, too thin or, or anything like that. So, so just make sure that they're durable rain boots because walking around in the rural areas season is pretty tough. Um, what about electricity? Is it 10 or 20? No, the voltage of that, I'm sorry, but it's just the plugs that you use in the United States. So you don't need adapters uh, for the plugs. So another question, if we do stay at Amos over a weekend, would we be provided meals? Yes, absolutely. So, so what we have is a checklist. So for people who want to stay at Amos over the weekend, um, you just basically write your name down on, on our checklist and and your meals will be provided for you. The people who decide to leave have to just basically let the guest house know that they're not going to be um, at the guest house over the weekend so that the, the cooks won't leave. So yes, you're provided three minutes a day for every single day. Is there a post office on Amos campus? Not have a postal system. Um, it's So you really can't mail anything out. Probably FedEx something if you needed to. Um, there's like private companies, uh, however, I just don't, I honestly don't recommend sending mail or receiving mail here because it probably will not work. If you are sending something back home, I think it might just be better to wait until you get there. Like for most of our mail, we do have a, a PO 
this, but it's not even located on our Amos campus. It's located really far away. It's a private company that does that. But actually, most of our mail that we get sent to Amos, we have a United States address, so it goes there. And then whenever we have someone coming down to Nicaragua, they just bring the mail to us. So it's it's a really, uh, you know, there's not existent mail system. Actually, there's not even addresses here, like, like physical addresses like you might have um, back in the States. So we just use landmarks here. So it'll be like, it basically it's like, you know, it's this kilometer on the highway close to the cemetery. So there's really no, no addresses. Yeah. Um, do you suggest, suggest for entrance to download a certain software like SAS data, etc.? Um, just if you would like to, just whichever one you, you, you know how to use and like to use. Um, if I don't see, like most of the analyses that you can do can be done in Excel. Um, however, if you're wanting to go the extra mile and do um, more advanced analyses, whatever program you want. Um, I use, I personally use R, um, and R is free for, for statistical um, packages and, and, and manipulating data. Um, I, I really like R. Yeah. Um, if, we're, if you're interested on traveling the weekends, is it better to plan that now or wait until we get there? Um, so I would say, um, maybe have a list of places that you want to visit, um, but you can definitely figure it out once you get here. Um, because like a lot of people are going to want to, you know, travel together and like decide where to go together. And then also right after um, we travel to the rural areas, we go on a retreat together. So I just don't want anyone really to get confused um, about some of the dates and things that we have to have going on. Um, so I would just say maybe have a list of ideal places that you would like to go and then, um, and then, and then, you know, problem finding hostels or hotels and um, setting up transportation and so forth. Um, okay, guys, I just want to thank everyone so, so much for, for being on this call. Um, additional questions you have feel free to shoot me an email it's jessica.hinshaw at amoshealth.org uh, and you can also email sharon um, the volunteer coordinator um, with just any questions that you might have so thank you so so much for we're really great to meeting all of you in person and and we're we can't express how excited we are that you're you're about to become a part of the amos family